For those interested in taking on a more active participation, here is a little more in-depth overview and familiarization with the bridge equipment and how things are laid out on the bridge. I'll cover the highlights of the major pieces of navigation, communication, and diagnostic equipment in this video. Conceptually, the area outlined in green identifies the primary pieces of navigational equipment located directly in front of the helm. So you have the chart plotter, steering autopilot, rudder angle indicator, compass, 96 mile radar, depth up at the bulbous bow, wind speed and direction, the throttle and shift lever, thrusters, VHF radio, GPS, information and main engine gauges. The outboard yellow areas are set up for co-piloting and to provide additional information and or scale to the helmsman consisting of a forward-looking searchlight sonar, 48-mile radar, closed-circuit TV, vessel monitoring, searchlight controller, navigational lights, floodlights, second chart plotter, a watch timer in the upper left corner of the upper bridge, emergency start-stop switches for all three engines. Pre-familiarizing yourself with the general layout and equipment before you come on board is a great advantage, especially if we are planning any early morning or overnight passages. The watch timer is located in the upper left corner of the upper dash and is used to track routine hourly engine room checks and to check position plots. After dark it is used for night watches and is typically set to 15 minute intervals. It is key switched to turn the unit on off and to set the desired time duration. Once the unit's running, if the red reset button isn't pushed when the countdown reaches zero, the red light will start flashing for 30 seconds and the unit will sound a local alarm. After which, if the reset button still hasn't been pushed, it trips the ship's main alarm as part of the vessel monitoring system. As soon as the red button is depressed, the program time interval is reestablished and begins the countdown process again. The system is purposefully situated far enough away from the helmsman so they have to physically get up and walk over in order to reset the timer. Moving over to the next display panel, this area of the upper dash provides the emergency start-stop buttons for both generators and for the main engine. You'll find an orange light will be illuminated for whichever generator is active and the KW meter located between these two sets of switches shows the load on that generator. This meter is selectable for generator 1 or generator 2 from an AB toggle switch which is located in the main electrical panel uh, in the engine room. Directly below the generator start stop panel are the engine hour meters which provide secondary backup hour meters uh, and uh, so you can maintain the maintenance intervals and track those from the pilot house. To the right of the hour meters is the main engine start stop buttons. To stop the main engine you need to flip up the red switch cover entitled stop uh, to the horizontal position and then lift the spring loaded toggle switch up and hold it up for a full second and then release it and that should stop the main engine. Located to the right of the main engine start stop switches are the main pressure and temperature gauges consisting of a pyrometer, engine water temperature, transmission and oil, temperature and pressure. All gauges are color coded for their normal range so when checking these gauges all you need to do is glance at the needle to see that it's within the normal range. This next area has already been fairly well covered in the safety briefing. For ease of access, the VHF radio and GPS 1 and 2 are located directly in front of the helmsman. The GPSs are each set to a different display to provide current latitude, longitude, and speed over the ground. Which of these two GPSs feed information to the auxiliary chart plotter is selectable via an AB switch shown with the red arrow just to the left of the mic. There is another AB switch located directly below the GPS selector switch which turns on or off the remote outside speaker for the VHF radio. The enunciator panel is especially useful when underway to see what pumps are running and for how long they are running. The green indicator lights represent pumps that normally cycle while the red indicator lights should they illuminate represent a problem which will require immediate attention. If you ever happen to see one of these red lights come on even for a second please let someone know. 
Below the enunciator panel is the rotary wiper washer switches, which are pretty standard, rotating through intermittent, slow, and fast. Just as a side note, we try never to use these wipers unless absolutely necessary. To the right is the defroster panel, which consists of two switches. The bottom switch turns on the fan or blower unit, and the upper switch, which is interlocked to the lower switch, turns on the heating unit for the defroster. To the right, the hydraulic panel engages uh, the three hydraulic pumps mounted to each of the engines. These are used only for thrusters when docking or operating various pieces of deck equipment. The upper left switch engages the main engine hydraulic pump and should only be engaged when at idle speed. The red light located between the two bottom switches uh, will illuminate when the main engine hydraulic pump is engaged. The two switches to the right of the main engine hydraulic pump are for generators one and two. There is no red illumination light for those uh, pumps. You'll see a note on the middle switch reminding the operator to check the KW load before engaging this pump. On this generator, number one, it must be below 10 KW. The switches on either side of the main engine hydraulic active light should be left in the position shown. For operating thrusters, you can use all three hydraulic pumps, although we generally operate with just the main engine and whatever generator is running. And for deck equipment, the main engine uh, is too strong and won't run any of the deck equipment. So either generator one and or generator two uh, need to be turned on for deck equipment. The double row of switches control the navigation and floodlights, which are already clearly labeled in white. To the right of the switch panel is an on-off dimmer switch to control the backlighting on all the Telcor instruments located on the upper and lower dash. Below the instrument dimmer switch is the switch connected to the three ceiling mounted directional aircraft night reading lights. And further to the right are the volt amp meters for both the 12 volt and 24 volt system. This digital clock is normally set to local time. The GPS satellite compass on the far right of the upper display panel is a very sophisticated commercial grade JRC satellite compass using three GPS's to determine the boat's course and speed. The unit is set up to provide all compass courses in true and is interfaced with the primary plotter, the 48 and 96 mile radar, the primary autopilot, and AIS. Switching to the lower main dash display will work from left to right with a quick overview of each piece of equipment. Manuals for all the equipment on board uh, will provide far greater detail and in-depth information than is intended from this video. Starting with the primary chart plotter off on the left, it is running NobleTech's Admiral software. It receives its information via a USB from a Nolan multiplexer mounted under the dash, uh, which receives position, speed over the ground, and heading from the JRC satellite compass in true. It also receives ARPA targets from both radars and AIS from other vessels. Its output is interfaced with the autopilot if selected through the AB switch on the lower flat dash shown here. The auxiliary chart plotter is running NobleTech's newer Time Zero software. It is a completely separate standalone computer which receives its information also via USB through a completely separate Nolan multiplexer, receiving its position, speed over ground, and heading from either of the two selected Furuno units on the upper dash. It also receives ARPA targets from both radars and AIS over NEMA 2000, and its output is interfaced to the autopilot through the AB switch on the lower flat dash, if so selected. In addition, the auxiliary chart plotter also outputs route and waypoint information, which is displayed on both radars via an Ethernet connection. Between the two chart plotters is an automated air horn controller, which allows the user to select a variety of signals from being a ground, operating in restricted visibility, SOS, danger signal, etc. Located directly above the controller is a manual air horn button. Directly under the display for the auxiliary chart plotter 
you'll see an inclinometer over on the left, followed by in the middle a B and G wind speed direction indicator, which will show apparent wind direction and speed, and a depth digital display, which has a selector switch located on the flat portion of the dash to select between a transducer located up at the front end of the boat, just under the bulbous bow, or amidships in the sonar pod. In the center of the screen, just to the right of the auxiliary display and above the autopilot, are three Maritron displays. So these are completely configurable, although the default setting is to display depth in the left uh, display and then true wind speed and direction in the center display. And the display to the right is typically set to speed through the water. This section is going to get a little packed in with information since there's a lot going on. So we are going to zoom in and concentrate on the autopilot and steering. It might be useful to pause the display at this point and read the written descriptions before listening to the complete narrative. The green alphanumeric display in the autopilot indicates the letter A for autopilot mode and the true course that the boat is heading in. In the upper right corner of the autopilot, the green and red buttons are momentary dodge buttons. The black rotary knob located just below and between the dodge buttons uh, permits course changing of one degree per detent, or if the wheel is depressed, then you get a 10 degree per detent course change. Between the course display and the rotary wheel, there is a red outline box with three color-coded buttons, which turns the autopilot on in the color blue to standby with the color orange or off by pushing the white button. Directly under the rotary wheel, there are three toggle switches outlined in red, which control the three steering pumps. We always run with just steering pump number one switched on, and then for docking, harbor operations, or tight maneuvering, we switch on pumps one and two for increased rudder response. The next panel down shows the engine RPM in red. The control panel outlined in red to the right of the RPM meter is a completely separate backup autopilot and to the right of that is the rudder angle indicator. As a side note, we never want more than 10 degrees of rudder when we're underway at speed. On the lower flat dash, you will see the transducer and autopilot selector switches which we previously went over. There is also a mechanical compass and to the left of the compass, are the proportional jog levers for the bow and stern thruster. In order for the thrusters to be active, uh, at least one of the three hydraulic pumps on the upper panel need to be switched on and the green button depressed to the left of the thrusters on the station active control. There are two wheels. The smaller wheel is a pilot wheel and is what we normally use to steer the boat. It is integrated with the autopilot and has a detent when the rudder is in the centered position. When the wheel is turned counterclockwise or clockwise, port or starboard, out of the detent, the letter A that appears in the upper green letters uh, next to the course uh, will display an M for manual steering. In other words, turning the wheel disengages the autopilot and takes over or permits manual steering. When you've then made the course correction and are pointing in the direction you want to be headed, returning the wheel to the center position, which is the detent, will give you a rudder angle of zero. The autopilot will automatically be re-engaged, and that letter M in the course display window will return to the letter A. For the pilot wheel to work, it needs to be engaged using a momentary switch outlined in red and labeled in the video above as pilot wheel engage. The larger wheel is emergency backup hydraulic steering, and for it to function, the autopilot must be switched to either standby or off using the orange or white buttons described earlier. Moving over to the right, we have the 96-mile Furuno radar, engine room and exterior thermometer, the NIAD hydraulic stabilizers, shift throttle control, and its respective station active button with red indicator light, air pressure gauge, and the tank level monitoring system. The 96-mile radar is too detailed to attempt to describe it in this video, but once running, it normally won't require any user input.
Below and to the left of the radar, you will see a round temperature gauge with a toggle switch allowing you to select between the engine room and outside air temperature. Uh, to the right of the temperature gauge is the controller display for the NIAT hydraulic stabilizers. These two do not normally require any user input. On the flat dash below, over to the left of the screen, you will have the station active button, which must be depressed at each of the five stations around the boat to activate and take control of the shift throttle control at that particular station. For the air controls to operate, they require a minimum of 40 psi of air pressure, which is why you see an air pressure gauge directly to the right of the station active button. When the desired station has been successfully activated, a red station active light will be illuminated. When the shift throttle control lever is at the 12 o'clock position, the shift lever is in neutral and an idle speed of approximately 650 RPM will be displayed in the tachometer. By pushing the shift throttle control lever forward one detent, it will engage the transmission into a head. Continuing to push the lever forward further will increase the RPM. Conversely, pulling the lever aft from the 12 o'clock position will engage reverse, and then continuing to pull the lever further towards you will increase the RPM in reverse. All shift throttle inputs should be made slowly and deliberately. Our normal cruising speed is 1,550 RPM, which will uh, be a position on the control lever of approximately 45 degrees forward of the 12 o'clock position towards the forward dash. In the event you have to do a quick stop, you should be sure to pause for a full two seconds in neutral before engaging reverse. Moving over to the far right side of the lower dash, uh, you'll see that you've got the uh, Furuno searchlight sonar display and its controller mounted on the flat dash portion uh, all the way aft. Uh, there's the Furuno 48 mile radar, a closed circuit TV camera system which controls six different cameras around the boat, uh, a remote for the backup autopilot and the vessel monitoring display, uh, the searchlight up on the mast, and its controller and the inverter controller panel. The Furuno searchlight sonar takes some playing around with to learn how to interpret the display. Uh, it also has the ability to be uh, a conventional downward looking uh, sonar unit, which is the way it is set up currently in this video. Uh, it deploys a transducer under the keel and then that transducer has the ability to look around the boat up to a range of 2,000 feet uh, and it works in much the same way as the radar works above the water. The Furuno 48 mile radar works almost the same as its bigger cousin, the 96 mile radar, and for the most part doesn't require any user input. There are six cameras connected to the closed circuit TV system. There is a pan tilt zoom on the mast and two in the engine room. And then there are other cameras on the aft deck, side deck, and in the salon area. And they're all controlled either by the touch screen display or the CCTV controller mounted on the dash. The Maritron vessel monitoring display works like the other displays around the boat. It's fully configurable to display up to 60 sensors and or you can set it to auto scroll through selected uh, screens uh, and or sensors. On the left here you see the under dash access which has the abandoned ship medical kit, Pelican case, Halon fire extinguisher and AED along with the circuit breaker panel. In the center of the screen you've got the center armrest which slides back exposing remote controllers for both uh, the 96-mile uh, radar, the 48-mile uh, radar, and the autopilot remote for steering and dodging from this location. The third major dash area in the pilot house is the upper dash on the aft navigation desk where there is a second ICOM VHF radio which we normally keep on channel 22 alpha, and one of the two vessel information displays, the second one being down in the engine room. In this section of the video, we'll take a look at a high-level pass through this system, discuss how information is gathered, collected, and displayed in each of the sub-displays. 
Essentially, there are four main display pages shown in the drop-down tabs located in the upper left area of the screen, Alerts, Underway, Anchored, and Docked. All the other tabs consist of sub-displays in order to drill down on active or pending alerts, specific areas, or systems. Touching the screen brings up the drop-down menu, then touching the desired tab takes you to that display. We'll start with the underway display. This page displays the main engine, generators, 12 and 24 volt systems, the tank levels, service hours remaining on each engine, roll pitch, apparent and true wind speed and direction, local and GMT time, heading, depth, exterior temperature, phase of the moon, and water pressure. There should be no red or yellow warning lights displayed on this page when underway. When at anchor, we're no longer interested in the main engine and are mostly concerned with our anchor watch. How far has the boat drifted from the anchor point? What's the water depth? In our case, we measure it from keel depth. What is the wind speed, wind direction, the condition of our 12 and 24 volt batteries, the generator that's running, uh, potable water pressure, tank levels, sunset, and sunrise. When we are docked, we are no longer interested in the main engine or generators and are more concerned with shore power, dock water pressure, and for planning purposes, managing upcoming engine service based on remaining service hours. And to a lesser extent, prior to departure, we are interested in monitoring our depth, wind speed, and the wind direction. This is our favorite display when underway, as it displays all the main engine information we are interested in monitoring, plus the shaft seal temperature, control air pressure, and the engine room ambient temperature. The information is presented in a standard gauge format with numerical and graphical display as well. All the gauges in the system have been designed so that the needles point to the 12 o'clock position uh, when they're operating at normal temperature or pressure. Glancing at any of these display pages, uh, all the needles should be between the 11 o'clock and 1300 position uh, and would indicate then that the system is functioning within the normal range. The gauges will keep track of the maximum and minimum readings with the triangular red and blue markers. The maximum minimum readings can be individually or collectively reset. Readings outside the normal range are represented in yellow and red sectors. If the temperature, pressure, voltage, frequency, amperage, etc. move into these sectors for longer than the designated duration, the system will sound an alarm and display the alarm condition. Certain alarms, such as fire, flood, anchor watch, and others, if not accepted within a specified time period, will flash the strobe at the top of the mast and send out a text message. The graphs can track and present the history of temperature, pressure, voltage, frequency, amperage, for the last minute or up to several days, and each graph is separately configurable. We typically display all graphs for the past hour and have found this information far easier to read at a glance and more useful than traditional gauge displays. With the graphical display, all you have to do is glance at the display page and all the lines should be horizontal. You instantly see any trends, like temperature slowly rising or pressure slowly dropping. Lastly, this page also has illuminated warning lights so that if anything were to move into the yellow cautionary area or the alert area, the lights would turn to orange or red. So a quick glance at the display will show you which system is alarming. The generator display works in very much the same way as the main engine display page. Plus it has high and low pressure alarms, engine hours between routine services, and the generator windings temperature along with illuminated warning lights. The battery bank display monitors the 12 and 24 volt batteries located in the engine room and pilot house. It is easy to see the minimum and maximum voltage, amperage draw, float voltage, and to determine if the charging source is able to keep up with the amperage demands. High-low voltage alarm points with short interval time delays are also incorporated in this display. The shore power display shows port and starboard incoming line voltage, amperage draw, and the interior component temperature of the AC power converters back in the pump room. The pump tank display monitors six pumps, how many times they have cycled, 
and their cumulative run hours, which is useful for performing routine maintenance and or overhauls. In terms of bilge pumps, seeing the number of cycles can be helpful to easily see the rate and duration of water intrusion and our ability to stay up with any leak. Over to the right side of the display, the water pressure digital gauge and graph show cut in and cut out pressures over time so you can see if the pressure sensing switch is calibrated correctly. The potable water display page monitors the water tank's levels and the ship's water pressure in a vertical bar, digital, and graph form. This display is typically used for two functions. First, when we are making water or filling the water tanks with dock water, there is a visual level indicator to help us monitor the progress, along with a high level warning and overfill alarms. And second, on the consumption side, the system allows us to closely monitor our water consumption along with a low level alarm so we don't run the tank or pump dry. We also have pump overrun alarms so that if the pump were to run for more than five minutes without cycling off, it will trip an alarm. This is extremely useful on long passage in case a hose were to break or a water valve were inadvertently left open. We can also go back with the graph several days to see if the rate of water consumption has changed and if it will work with our remaining cruising plan. We display our quantity of water as a percentage rather than in gallons, so you have to multiply the percentage times 1,500 gallons to determine how many gallons are remaining in the tank. The chilled water and environment display contains a lot of useful information, especially when operating in cold, warm, or changing weather. The upper left section of the display gives an indication of the effectiveness and efficiency of the heating and air conditioning system in terms of adding or removing heat. The barometer, albeit a bit old fashioned, is still a great way to forecast severe weather, especially when cruising in remote areas where internet or radio weather is not available. The speed over ground display is a great way to see our current speed made good and the average speed over longer periods of time. The roll pitch display allows us to measure sea conditions, effectiveness of the roll stabilizers, and the relative comfort for those on board the boat. It also allows us to objectively measure if sea conditions are improving or deteriorating. Tank levels is useful in determining consumption rates of fresh water and if we have any plumbing leaks, which would normally be flowing out through the gray or black tanks. Knowing the tank levels is also extremely useful before coming into port. The ship's compressed and control air pressure has been a surprisingly valuable tool. If we look at just the air control pressure, it is relatively stable and indicates that there are no problems in the system. However, looking at the graph on the right side shows that the ship's air compressor is running at 87 psi, is highlighted in yellow, and that the pump is cycling approximately every seven and a half minutes where, based on historical knowledge provided by the system, we can pretty quickly determine that we have an air leak somewhere in the system. It took us a few minutes to determine that there is an air leak, find the sensor that had gone bad, and to replace it. Here is the same display after changing out the faulty pressure sensor. The ship's air compressor cycling has gone from seven and a half minutes per cycle back to its normal rate of about once every 40 minutes. The GPS status display is primarily for diagnostic purposes just to confirm that the system's GPS is functioning normally. The status display is rarely used, but on occasion we have had watch standards that find the other displays to be a bit overly complicated. With this display, if there are any problems or issues, they show up in yellow or red, are quickly identified, and the information can be passed along to another crew member. The exterior climate page was set up to monitor an incoming storm or severe weather to log maximum wind gusts, freezing point, and wind chill. There is an alarm set if the wind speed exceeds 45 miles an hour for a sustained period of time. The depth page is infrequently used but has proven useful on rare occasions when monitoring extreme tides or looking at how much water was under the keel after approaching an anchorage or a harbor. The trim display is mostly used in the engine room when fueling, transferring fuel, or tanking the bulb. The next four images show some of the information that is available on the nine smaller displays around the boat. 
This allows guests to monitor the outside temperature, wind speed, real feel, or for those more involved in the boat's operations, we can quickly see how far we have moved from our anchor point, wind speed and direction, tank levels, engine conditions, bilge and water pumps, fire, battery conditions, etc. Basically all the information presented in the large displays can also be shown in any of these smaller displays and they can be set up to auto scroll through the desired screens for that location. So in the next three pages I've given an overview of what the alarm programming looks like. There are approximately 150 alarm points, 75 of which are warning alarms and 75 which are high level alarms. These sheets will describe the trigger points for an alarm, if there's a delay, how long the delay is, what the clear point is, if there's a delay on the clear point, the type of tone that it sounds, and whether or not it will send out an email or text message if it illuminates the strobe and whether it's a high level or a low level alarm. So this is going to be a more detailed safety briefing on the engine room doing uh, routine engine room checks. Uh, so again, you'll make sure you have a headset on uh, before coming into the engine room. You'll undog the engine room door, open it. It will, um, if you open it all the way, it catches. So since uh, you probably don't want that, you want to close this door and dog it behind you. And then once you come in the engine room, uh, you'll see, the first thing you'll see uh, is through the window to make sure that there's no smoke or fire before you open the door. Um, then when you, you put your headset on, open the door, come in, and then this is station one, is to look here at the mechanical gauges on the front of the engine, and they're all color-coded and marked for where the green area is, and they should all be within that green area, so it takes just a second to do a quick pan of these, make sure all of these are displaying um, the normal operating temperature. Again, this is the emergency stop button over here. Uh, so that's kind of station one when you do an engine room check. That takes about 10 seconds. Then you'll look down here. This is area two. This valve will be open like it is now. That flow wheel will be turning. So you just check to make sure that the flow wheel is turning and we have raw water going through here to cool the NIAD uh, stabilizers. And then uh, do a visual check that there's no fluids or any leaks or any kind down in the bilge in this area. So you, you were in this area, station one, station two. Station three is over here. It's the flow uh, wheel indicator for cooling the main engine exhaust. You want to check that that's going around. It's marked with the number three, which is probably difficult to see from this camera angle. So then as you move around to the port side of the engine, I'll step try and step out of the way here. Uh, so this is called four here, which is just looking at this whole port side of the engine, and you're just doing a quick sweep to make sure that you don't see any leaks, doing a quick look down into the bilge. You will notice that there is a manifold system along this bottom here. This is an emergency bilge pump manifold, which can be operated with this big engine-driven pump on the front in case uh, we get a leak that we can't manage with the uh, electric bilge pumps. Uh, so that's what this manifold is here. So this is anyway station four, which is looking along the port side of the engine. Station five is using a temperature gun to read the temperature on the oil filters, which it's marked here 195 to 200 degrees. We do have temperature sensors all over the place here to tell us what the oil temperature is, but it's nice to get a sanity check well, with an independent gauge when you're in here. From this station five, you go to six, which is the transmission. Uh, that's labeled 6. Its temperature should be 165 to 175 and you just shine uh, the uh, or point the temperature probe right here at this fitting where the, where the label is and that should be the temperature in here. So you're still looking now back at the aft end of the engine room. This is the transmission or reduction gear um, and then while you're in this position uh, you'll usually have a flashlight and you'll grab the flashlight and kneel down here in this location and then you can look in this opening right here and you can sight down to the stuffing box where the shaft goes through to the propeller and just see if we have any leak there. There's also a plexiglass window here which you can use to look in but it's better to look from this angle uh, to be looking aft. 
These are flow meters if any of these systems are running. So it's water maker, air conditioning, hydraulic cooling. You can see that you're getting flow there. Uh, and then these are the on-off valves for generator 1 and generator 2. This is the on-off valve for the main sea chest. And all the raw water for the boat uh, essentially comes in through this one opening. So if you ever had a leak of raw water, um, closing that valve would eliminate most all leaks uh, that we would have uh, for raw water coming into the boat. And then off to the or the left of your screen, you see this opening here into the sound box, and that's uh, you're just looking at the inside of generator two, which we'll get to in a minute. But first, I think what we'll do is take you aft from here. So now you've checked the transmission. You're probably 30 seconds into an engine room check. All right, so continuing aft into the pump room, it's already undogged, so we can just open the door and walk in. So the first thing you'll do when you go into the room, same thing with the engine room, is to see if you smell anything that's, uh, that shouldn't be there, an exhaust, oil, diesel. Uh, next, you'll just take a quick look over here at these uh, bilge rat counters. They will tell you if any of these two, either of these two main bilge pumps have cycled. The counters should read zero like they do now. Uh, and then just a visual check, looking outboard at the compressor and then the blue pumps, you see two of them all the way outboard. Those are the steering pumps. There's a blue piece of paper under those through-hull valves, which would pick up any salt water or hydraulic leak. So you do a quick scan of those areas. Looking forward, back into the engine room, and now off to the starboard side in the pump room is another uh, Halon uh, actuation. Uh, device for the fire extinguisher. So here again, if you were in this compartment and had a fire, you could manually turn the fans off at this location here by pulling down on a pin that's underneath that unit. And you just pull down on it. And then on the actuator, you would pull the, the that ring out and then depress the plunger. And that would activate the halon system in the engine room. Okay, so from the fire suppression system that's located in the pump room, we're just going to look aft again. We're going to go in through this door, uh, which goes into the steering compartment. And this allows us to check the steering ram for any oil leaks and temperature. Um, and you can, this is the packing gland, you can see if it's leaking there. Uh, and there's a bilge compartment located just below the picture frame here, which you can also open up and inspect to make sure there's no water. Continuing back into the engine room now, we're going to check the starboard side of the main engine and the generators. So if generator 2 is running or generator 1, they're both the same, you're going to look to see that the flow wheel is turning, that's raw water cooling and to the left of it and slightly below shows you the oil level uh, in the generator so you can make sure that there's adequate oil level um, and it hasn't either gone up or gone down. The red line marks where the oil level should be when it's running and the blue line is where the oil level should be when it's cold and turned off. These are the uh, exhaust penetration here for the second generator and on the aft bulkhead here there's cooling fans and there's uh, two temperature gauges. So the temperature gauge on the right is telling you uh, what the temperature is in the air box uh, at the windings of generator 2. We want that to be ideally not above 110, certainly not above 130, which is where the red line is marked. And uh, so we just do a quick glance at that to make sure it's where it should be. And the temperature gauge outboard of that is measuring the temperature on the main engine exhaust behind the stainless perf plate to make sure just as a kind of secondary check that we're getting adequate cooling to the exhaust system. So panning forward, we're now looking uh, in the center of the screen at the stabilizing system. The engine is on the left. So as we move forward, we'll scroll down at the starboard side of the main engine. Here we'll take a look to make sure there's no leaks in the bilge and you'll see several 
uh, gauges uh, running along the floorboards there, uh, and those are measuring what the uh, fuel vacuum uh, rate is on each of the primary fuel filters and so you can see if we're getting if we have any problem uh, in terms of a filter getting clogged also if there's water in the fuel a red light will come on so we just do a quick glance at that and if you see right here that's referred to in the center of the screen as station number 11 this area right here is the main engine coolant expansion tank and we can read the level of the coolant on there so you'll take a quick glance at that we also monitor that from the cameras up in the pilot house so if gen 1 was running here's gen 1's access door I'm gonna back out of my own way here so you would do a check to be the same as doing gen 2 but up above gen 1 so this is just on the left as you come into the engine room is the start stop and uh, gauge panels for both the generators and you'll see that they, they've got marks on them for where the temperature should be um, and, and what the pressure should be uh, you can also see engine hours to stop these uh, either generator um, in an emergency you just push this to stop momentarily and release it just to the uh, to the left of the uh, gen 1 uh, start stop uh, panel is a temperature gauge for the uh, windings at Gen 1 if we're running off that generator. So it's only typically we run one generator at a time. Uh, whichever one is running is the gauge you'll be checking and the generator you'll be checking. Moving forward, so as you're just completing now your 360 degree tour of the engine room is the NIAD stabilizers. Here you can see in the window the oil level. It should be up around the red line. You can see the pressure gauge, which should be about 1,450 PSI. It'll be up on the blue uh, line. The needle will be pointed about 12 o'clock. And then you can see the temperature of the oil, which typically runs at about 175 to 180 degrees. And it's marked right on that temperature probe as well, in case you forget. At this point, maybe take a quick look at the filter for the NIAD. It should just be in the OK green position. It's worth checking. One last thing before you leave the engine room is to come over to the electrical panel. Just do a quick scan of the panel. Make sure no breakers are turned off that aren't supposed to be turned off and that all the indicators are pretty much where you would expect them to be and there's no surprises. And that pretty well would conclude an engine room check. That whole check actually takes about 90 seconds from the time you leave the bridge to the time you return. It goes surprisingly quick once you get used to doing it. Then just remember to dog the door on your way out and to take off the headset, hang it back up on the wall, and to turn it off. If we're running at night or people are sleeping, then that outer vestibule door will be closed so it becomes like a interlocking noise chamber so that we don't let all the noise from the engine room wake up people who are sleeping. Finally, just a quick review of a few of the documents you will want to be familiar with, all of which is undoubtedly familiar to you and fairly basic, but worth a quick review. We take a great deal of pride in maintaining Oasis in first-class condition, which is in large measure due to our guests and crew being thoughtful and careful. A few of the basic rules, we are a non-smoking boat, no alcohol within eight hours of being underway. To avoid any broken toes, we ask you wear non-marking rubber sole shoes inside and outside the boat. Please do not leave items out or doors and drawers unlatched. So in a couple words, neatness counts. If you are taking any medication, are under a doctor's care, or have any health issues, please let us know. It will be kept confidential, but it's important for us to know that information. As for our pre-departure checklist, this is an abbreviated checklist of our longer three-page voyage preparation checklist and gives you an idea of the kinds of things to be aware of prior to getting underway. The standing day and night orders sets forth the watch schedule, procedures for coming on watch, makes the oncoming watch stander responsible for confirming the ship's present position, situational awareness, checking all the navigation and mechanical equipment, and settings for proper function and operation of the systems on the bridge. It sets forth rules for meeting, crossing, passing, or overtaking another vessel, engine room checks, 
orienting the next watchstander when going off watch and when to wake the captain. The safety briefing checklist is a good refresher for the safety video which is organized by location. You will find a copy of this briefing in the cruising notebook in your stateroom. The abbreviated abandoned ship's procedures is a summary of the four pages that you'll see in the notebook in your room. It's broken into three main areas of green, meaning serious concern that the ship may be in trouble, yellow, a possible abandoned ship situation and to get prepared, and red, indicating the decision has been made to abandon ship.